Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Blackburn. I work at the physics department at uh, Lund University. And this afternoon, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, magnetic aspects of small angle neutron scattering. Uh, so that will uh, include uh, some information on how we look at magnetic materials generally using neutrons, and then very more specifically, what we can learn uh, from doing small angle neutron scattering experiments about magnetic materials. OK, so I should say, please feel free to interrupt, either verbally or through the chat, if you have any questions or anything that you want to ask for more information about. Um, right, so to get started. Uh, okay, so uh, what we will, what I will talk about today is the difference between nuclear and magnetic scattering of neutrons, what that means for our experiments, and here by experiments I am implicitly referring to small angle neutron scattering experiments, how we can optimize our experiments to take advantage of these differences to pick out magnetic features, and what are the things that we need to account for when measuring magnetic materials. So I think already you've learned quite a bit about the kinds of things that one can learn from small angle neutron scattering. And I'm going to, all of those things remain true for magnetic, uh, for materials with magnetic components. Uh, but there are some additional things that uh, change some of the assumptions that, that we make. Okay, uh, right. Um, and just uh, to let you know, the picture to the side here is, uh, is a commemoration of the discovery of the neutron by, by uh, James Chadwick way back when. Right, so what do neutrons interact with? So you've already, you've already covered this to uh, some extent, or, but uh, as you know, they couple to nuclei via the strong force, and this is a short range interaction. And so we can basically approximate that as, uh, as if a single nucleus exists at a single point, so that the nuclei in the material are point scatterers. And so we can then say that the so associated scattering potential is uh, this formula here. So this is the scattering potential. This is the delta function indicating that the nucleus, uh, we can effectively treat it as a single point. B here is our scattering length, which we will eventually convert into scattering length densities. Um, and then we have some prefactors here relating to the mass of the neutron and the Planck constant. So this is just due to the interaction between, between nucleons because the neutron is a nucleon. Um, however, as you can see up here, if we look at the basic properties of the neutron, um, in addition to, uh, to its mass, it also carries a spin. Um, and that means it's, it's got a spin one half. So that it looks a bit like a little magnetic dipole. And the magnetic dipole moment associated with that is uh, minus 1.9 nuclear magnetons. Now, um, ah. And we'll come to what that what that actually means in a moment. Okay. And that moment is now, I hope. Right. Um, so uh, what I've written here is that this is equal to uh, one thousandth of a mu b. So a mu b is a Bohr magneton. The Bohr magneton is the magnetic dipole moment associated with an electron. So when we are looking at most materials, any magnetic components or the strongest parts of the magnetic component usually come from the electron. So this Bohr magneton is our scale of reference. OK, so in addition to interacting with the strong force, the neutrons also couple to magnetic fields. Um, and, so, uh, and so they will be able to diffract off periodic variations in magnetic fields and interact with changes um, changes in the magnetic field distribution, much in the same way as they uh, interact with the uh, changes in the um, uh, in the uh, atomic density. Um, so in a solid, these magnetic fields are generated by magnetic nuclei and electrons. However, because the uh, moment associated with the magnetic nuclei is usually very small, a thousandth of that of the electron, um, the electron, the electron behavior usually dominates. So um, for now, we will basically ignore any effects from magnetic nuclei. They exist. They can be important sometimes. But for the purposes of this, uh, uh, of this course, we'll pretend they don't exist um, for now. And uh, we mostly assume that we can model the magnetic fields that arise in materials by taking the atom and placing a magnetic moment on it. So we're, um, 
basically treating the atoms as carrying particular magnetic moments or magnetic dipoles and then figuring out the associated magnetic fields uh, from there. Okay, how does this help us if we want to look at magnetic structures? So we can see that we can interact with variations in the magnetic field, um, but, there are, uh, but then uh, how do we actually get information out about our magnetic materials? So there are a couple of ways that you can think about this. I'm going to start with the, uh, what is sometimes referred to in the, uh, in the literature as the color approach, where the idea is that the magnetization on a particular atom uh, can be thought of as a color, so that it's just some simple label. So uh, I'm now going to use a, magnet a non-magnetic example to illustrate this. And so far, we're not really talking about small angle stuff. This is rather uh, more general diffraction. Um, but if we take copper three gold, which is a particular alloy, um, when it's at high temperatures, three quarter, there's a 75% chance that this atom will be copper and a 25% chance that, uh, that this will be gold. And in that case, uh, if we were to do a diffraction experiment, um, an X-ray powder diffraction experiment, then we will see various uh, Bragg peaks that correspond to the, to the periodicities associated with the atomic planes, for example, our 111, this peak here, corresponds to the difference between, between these planes here. If we cool this down, then we end up with the coppers going to particular places and the golds going to particular other places. This is why, uh, this, is why this is called a color approach. We've basically given each of these sites, which were previously gray, the color, so they look different. And if they look different, then that means that they have some different uh, symmetry and we can no longer say uh, that this atom here is the same as this atom here. Instead, this one is now gold and this one is now copper. And so that means that we end up with some additional Bragg reflections that take into account the change in the, the, change in the symmetry. Um, and so we can, see this, uh, we can see this change in the structure of copper three gold by looking for the appearance of additional, of, of additional reflections. So this is not magnetic, but uh, if we take a magnetic example, this is manganese oxide. So this was the first material to be investigated by neutron scattering to show that it had a particular type of magnetic behavior called antiferromagnetism. So we start out at high temperatures and this is the, uh, this is the structure, the chemical structure, and there is no magnetization associated at the moment. And then you will end up with uh, some diffraction. This is now neutron diffraction rather than X-ray diffraction. And you'll see that there are some peaks associated with this structure. We cool it down and a certain type of magnetic order develops and we can uh, treat this by putting arrows onto our manganese atoms. And uh, you'll notice that this arrow is pointing up, whereas all of the ones in this plane are pointing down and then all of the ones in this plane are pointing up, etc. And so that gives, oh, I've gone the wrong way. And so that gives rise to the appearance of additional Bragg reflections, just as with the copper three gold case. And in this case, this is a purely magnetic reflection that has appeared because it only exists because of the difference in the direction of the magnetic moment here and the magnetic moment here. So that means that if we have magnetic order in our material, so some periodic variation in the magnetic order, we will be able to see Bragg reflections from that. Okay. So what that points to is that our color approach of giving things a particular color, it can take us a certain distance, but we also have to take into account the fact that magnetic moments are vectors. Um, and uh, this may sound like an obvious statement, but it has a number of uh, very important consequences. So the magnetic moment is not just a label, the moment direction matters. And uh, the direction in which a particular moment may lie is may be restricted by the nature of the atom that it's sitting on or the orientation of the electron orbitals in the crystal lattice or various other effects. And we can detect the magnetic moment direction using neutrons because we have an interaction between two different dipoles. The first dipole being the atomic magnetic moment. So in the previous example, the little arrow sitting on the manganese and also the neutron magnetic dipole, which may be pointing in any particular direction. So to get straight to the results, um, and we'll go through this in a, in a moment very briefly, um, the uh, only magnetization that we can be sensitive to is that which is perpendicular to our scattering vector, okay? 
Um, so our scattering vector capital Q. So if our capital, if our scattering vector points this way, then we can see magnetic magnet. Uh, we can see magnetic signal that is perpendicular to it, but we can't see anything that's parallel to it. And we can get extra information if we are able to control the direction of the neutron dipole. So we refer to this as polarizing the neutron beam. And so there are a couple of uh, examples in this cartoon. So this cartoon here represents most of the uh, information that you need to know um, about how neutrons interact with magnetic moments for at least a, an initial interpretation of, uh, of, of data. But we'll go into a little bit more detail, not too much detail, but a little bit more detail. So in a given neutron scattering experiment, what we're eventually trying to measure is uh, the differential cross section here, the d sigma by d omega, where, where, d, where d omega is the um, uh, solid angle um, of the pixels or the detector that we're looking at. And so this is basically the quantity that we measure, the number of neutrons that are scattered into that solid angle in a particular direction, normalized by the neutron flux into that solid angle for, for the same solid angle. Um, and uh, we can go a step further and look at the uh, energy resolution. So most of the time uh, in small angle neutron scattering, we're not too bothered about this energy, uh, this energy resolution aspect. But so when you're looking at um, materials at low temperatures, this can become a little bit more important because of some effects that has on the uh, symmetry of the response for uh, energy, neutron energy loss and neutron energy gain. So as it says here, I've given some links at the end. There's a slide at the end with some references. So if you want to learn about uh, getting to the final equation, then you can look there. But basically, we end up with an expression for our cross section that depends upon this potential here, V. OK? And in the end, it's actually the, the, the V squared after, after taking into account the interaction between the neutron and the sample. Um, uh, coming in and uh, then coming out of the sample. So we have this potential. And uh, we already know that if we're looking at the structural case, then this potential is just a delta function multiplied by the scattering length. Um, and so then in the uh, usual nuclear scattering case, we will end up with a, um, a contribution that goes as the square of the scattering length. OK, right. Um, so for magnetic scattering, as you may have guessed, the interaction potential is much more complicated as the forces involved are not central, um, are not central over long range, longer ranges. And we have to take into account the fact that the magnetic moments are vectors. And our expression for the potential looks like this. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this B here represents the magnetic uh, the magnetic field associated with the sample and its interaction with the magnetic moment of the neutron. And then there are various terms here. So I put this in, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not going to derive this at this point. Um, if you're interested in finding out about it, contact me and I can give you further information um, about getting to this. But uh, what we can do with this uh, is uh, is that we can then use that to get to uh, to ba basically to motivate the cartoon that I showed you on the previous slide, um, and I just also uh, wanted to highlight um, that here we're treating in the nuclear case we're treating the nucleus as a point scatterer, and in the magnetic case the electron is distributed over a larger spatial area, um, and so that has some consequences that we'll also touch on in a moment. Okay, so. We have this expression, we have this potential, we take our potential uh, from the previous slide and we can eventually get an expression in terms of the, for, the, for our cross section in terms of the total, the, the magnetization or really the Fourier transform of the magnetization. This is this M of Q. And uh, if you work through, the, work through it properly, what you find out is that the actual term that you get in your cross section is this uh, sigma? So this is related to the to the neutron uh, the neutron uh, dipole, uh, taking the dot product with something that's written as mag m perp m perpendicular. So this is the 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 uh, contribution of the magnetization that is perpendicular to Q. So that's what my cartoon was showing, and this is the way that this is mathematically expressed. Okay, so. You have this particular expression, and this particular expression is basically the mathematical representation of this picture here. Um, but so uh, we will only be able to see magnetic signal in uh, in directions that is perpendicular to our scattering vector. And if we take this expression for m of q and we break it down into the component parts, 
Then we have uh, individual moments. So these are the arrows on the manganese in my earlier example. We have information about the lattice, uh, the structure factor. We have uh, a, a thermal factor uh, in the thing uh, representing uh, the uh, influence of thermal energy on how well we can average a structure. And then we also have a form factor, um, F, F of Q here. And this is an illustration. This is the uh, representation of the fact that the magnetization distribution is not point-like, like, but exists over a, a, reasonable, a reasonable range in real space. And uh, this sketch here, this picture here is an example of the form factor for holmium, uh, for, for a particular holmium ion, the holmium three plus ion. And so this uh, line here, the magenta line, that is the representation of the form factor. And there are several contributions to it shown by the black and the, the red. So what this is, uh, what this really means is that your magnetic signal drops off pretty rapidly as a function of the scattering vector. So the uh, x-axis here, is basically Q. And so this drops off relatively, relatively rapidly. Um, and so uh, this uh, is obviously helpful. So this means that you will be normally get a strong, sig strong magnetic signal or as strong a magnetic signal as you will ever get in the small angle regime, because you're normally here where basically this is very, very close to one for most materials. So if you can get a magnetic signal in a small angle scattering experiment, it will usually be pretty strong, which is, which is helpful. OK, so uh, that was my little diversion as to uh, on where this particular cartoon comes from. But this cartoon is the, uh, is the kind of key takeaway, I would say, to, to remember uh, moving forward. Um, and, uh, and so I'll now come to what does that actually mean for our experiments? So I'll be sticking with a, a couple of simple structures to illustrate um, a couple of points. Um, so if I take this, uh, this simple structure here, um, and I have given it a particular magnetic structure. So this is the real space representation of a simple cubic structure, simple cubic nuclear structure. And then I have uh, some uh, magnetic moments on the atoms so that in this plane, they're pointing upwards and in this plane, they're pointing downwards. Um, and so that means that symmetrically, this atom is different to this one. And that means that uh, we will end up with uh, uh, with the uh, nuclear Bragg reflections shown by the gray circles and then magnetic Bragg reflections shown by the blue circles. Um, and so if we have this as our material, this is what we would see in a diffraction pattern. If we now rotate the moments so that they lie <coughs> along this direction, um, so they, in some sense, they possess the same symmetry if we just consider them as colors, because this one is pointing one way, this one is pointing the same way as that one, but these two are pointing in opposite directions. However, um, the actual direction of this arrow makes a difference. And what we will see from this material is that we won't see a reflection in these two places. So if we, uh, if we carry out an experiment and we were to measure here, we would be able to distinguish between the structure that you can see on the left and this structure here. OK. Um, and this is, this is um, particularly relevant if one is doing small angle diffraction because what matters in this case is the, uh, is the uh, relationship between the scattering vector and, uh, and the magnetization. So if we're talking about the magnetic reflection that is here, if we uh, figure out what our scattering vector capital Q is, then it's basically uh, lying in a direction which is in, in the way that I've drawn this, in the QX direction. Um, and as you can see, the X direction is uh, perpendicular to the direction of the moments. So this one is visible. Um, but if we now go to this particular case, these moments are lying along the X direction. And so therefore we end up with a cancellation and we cannot see, uh, cannot see what's happening here. So by looking at magnetic peaks that are very, very close, that are, that are kind of close to our zero position, um, we can assume that the mo we, we know very well what the direction of the scattering vector is, and we can use that to infer information about the direction of the moments. OK, right. Moving now to uh, uh, what uh, may be more familiar to you as a small angle neutron scattering pattern. So this is uh, an example of some data that has been collected um, from a magnetic material. And what you can see here is that this data, these data are not uh, on the detector are not radially symmetric. So if this is the beam center covered by a beam stop, 
um, then you can see that we do not have a, a cylindrically symmetric pattern. Instead, we have uh, some lobes here and then less scattering in this, in this region here. So if I then were to put onto this sketch of, the, uh, of the small, this uh, cartoon of the small angle scattering instrument, then I have my neutron beam coming in. And then if I go to a particular point on the detector, then I can work out what my Q is. So uh, this, uh, the direction of this Q is slightly ex exaggerated because in my picture, in my picture is not to scale. Um, but uh, this Q will basically be almost, so if I'm looking um, at a point on the detector here, that corresponds to the tip of this green arrow here, then <clears throat> the direction of my scattering vector is almost, but not quite parallel to the green vector. And uh, in, this, in, in this cartoon, the difference is larger than it would be in uh, most experiments. So if I look at this particular position on the detector, um, then my Q, uh, my total scattering vector is basically parallel to this. And so that means that, uh, that I will only be able to see magnetic signal um, that is pointing either in the X direction or the Z direction. And similarly, if I look at a position on the detector at the end of the blue arrow, then in that case, my Q, if you imagine this rotating round, will be uh, basically parallel to the QX direction. And in that case, if I'm looking along the QX direction, I will only be able to see uh, magnetic scattering coming from the Y direction and the Z direction, which is out of the, out of the plane of the detector. <clears throat> so if we consider uh, the data that's uh, contained in this particular image, um, then uh, what we can observe is that with the scattering vector parallel to QY, so up coming up here, there is no, uh, we have less scattering. So there's no additional magnetic signal seen. Whereas if we look along this direction, we have some additional scattering and this is additional magnetic scattering. And so therefore what we can conclude from that is that the scattering system has a significant magnetization, uh, significant magnetization or contributions that are parallel to QY. And then if this is say a cubic material, we can relate that directly um, to uh, whatever the relevant axis is in our, in our sample. Okay, so uh, we could so therefore say that if we made this measurement, we can make some statement about the magnetization that it has components um, I've drawn this where they're all pointing in the same direction, they're all pointing upwards, but there could be some uh, up and down components as long as they're pointing in the Y direction, either up or down. And if we uh, did a different measurement uh, and we obtained basically this pattern rotated, then that would tell us uh, that what we were looking at with the magnetization would be rotated um, so that the magnetization that we're probing as a component, it uh, has its components along the X direction. Okay, so what we can get from that is that we can uh, get information about the direction of the magnetization. And we can also use that to differentiate between um, uh, magnetic contributions and non-magnetic contributions. So in this uh, in this uh, in this particular example, we might we might be able to assume that there were no magnetic contributions here, and only magnetic contributions here, and therefore the behavior in this direction represents the contributions from uh, things like the particle shape, the particle size, the polydispersity, that kind of thing. And that those will probably exist in this direction too, but then we also have some additional magnetic, uh, some magnetic information. Um, and I'll give a, another example of that right now. So some samples, some materials may already have some inbuilt magnetization that is forced to point in a particular direction. Um, however, uh, it's helpful for us as a, uh, when designing an experiment if there is some way that we can control this ourselves. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to use an example um, using uh, magnetite particles, so Fe3O, Fe3O4 particles. Um, so these are found in many places. This is just a picture of uh, little magnetite particles inside magnetotactic bacteria. Um, so these are bacteria that use uh, this like spine of magnetite particles uh, 
um, to orient themselves uh, and so that they can move in response to magnetic fields. If you are interested, there are some, some nice videos you can find um, by searching for uh, little bacteria building pyramids. Um, and in the case of, the, uh, of these bacteria, these, uh, these particles are arranged in a line. Um, and so uh, if I take, a, if I take a, uh, like a, big, a big amount of these magnetite particles in a close packed array, uh, then I will end up with uh, a set of the particles in a sort of amorphous arrangement, a bit uh, like this uh, example with um, uh, little, metal, little metal balls, where there is some characteristic separation distance, but there's no long range order. Um, and so uh, what we would see from scattering in that case is a ring like this on our, on our detector, um, where the, uh, uh, the position of the ring in Q can be used to figure out the size of the, the average size of the particles. And I think you've already covered how to do, how to do things like that. Um, and so uh, we, will, we will have this ring of scattering that is associated with the uh, separation of the particles, but we can also apply a magnetic field and if we apply that magnetic field, then our magnetite particles will respond. Um, and uh, if we apply a large enough field, we will get all of those particles to be at what we call saturation magnetization, so that they have a uniform magnetization that points in the direction of the applied magnetic field. So if in this case, this is uh, meant to be a field that is applied in the X direction of the detector plane, so in the QX direction, um, using the axes that are shown here. And uh, so we expect that the magnetization will all lie in this particular direction. And so if we consider what's happening along the Y direction, uh, if we uh, forget about our magnetic field for the moment, we would expect a nuclear contribution denoted by N here, N squared, because in the end our cross section is always taking the square of the contributions. Uh, a contribution from magnetic magnetization in the x direction, magnetization in the, z, in the z direction. And then if we look along the x direction, it's the same, except that instead of uh, this mx here, we have an my here. OK, so if the magnetic field that we apply is large enough, then as I said, the magnetization of the particles all points in the same direction, which is parallel to the field. So what does that mean? It means all of the magnetization is in x squared and we don't have any, or we will assume that we don't have any in these other parts, so that we should expect to see a contribution only in the y direction um, and not in the x direction. And if we were to look <coughs> at a direction in between, so at 45 degrees, then we would expect to basically get a, a vector sum of the contributions along y or x. So we will get a smoothly, we will have a maximal, maximal magnetic signal here and that will smoothly decay until it gets to zero here following um, a trigonometric function. So if we uh, take our observation here from, uh, and we uh, basically split it up to consider two different, uh, the two different directions. So these uh, lines here uh, represent what we, what we call sectors that have been looked at. So we have, a, we have two vertical sectors and two horizontal sectors. And we expect to see a magnetic signal in the uh, vertical sectors and no magnetic signal in the um, horizontal sectors. And uh, if you look at the data, this is shown here. Um, and so uh, we can see, so this is taking, this is basically taking uh, the intensity as a function of the magnitude of Q as we, as we move through these sectors. And what you find is that the red line is, the, is from the horizontal sectors and the black line is from the, uh, from the vertical sectors. And uh, what you can see is that there is a very small difference between the two, with the black line being uh, slightly, slightly higher. Um, and so one can use that to uh, basically figure out what the contribution from the magnetic scattering is. And although this is a very small difference, it is measurable. Um, and it corresponds to um, what is expected for this particular material, which is that uh, there is a uh, basically a fraction of, the, you can calculate the fraction of the magnetic scattering that is associated uh, with this, with this small increase in the black line with respect to the red line. And uh, one other thing to note here is that uh, this, uh, you can think about this in terms of the scattering length density. So we have the contribution from the nuclear components 
we have the magnetic component, and this is the same order of magnitude as the nuclear component. So that the magnetic signal is not necessarily a lot weaker. Um, and in this case, in this case, the overall contribution is uh, is small, um, but the uh, uh, it's not invisibly small. Let's say. Okay. Right. So we can use an external magnetic field to control our. Um, uh, we can use an external magnetic field to help us uh, to, to help us figure out what the magnetic contributions are. We can also play around with directing the polarization of the neutrons. So that means that we then try to uh, try to make all of the neutrons in, that, are, that are in the beam and that are hitting the sample have their dipole moments pointing in the in the same direction. Uh, there are several methods uh, as to how one can do this. I'm not going to go into how that's done. Um, but uh, once you are able to do that, then uh, there are several several directions that may be more or less interesting to place that polarization. So for example, if I place that polarization of the neutron beam such that it is uh, parallel to the total scat to the to the scattering vector, so this is this particular case here, then when the neutron interacts, with a um, with a magnetic moment, um, so uh, <clears throat> when we have the interaction between the moment on uh, on an atom and the neutron dipole moment, if uh, the two are perpendicular, then the neutron's moment will be flipped. Uh, so that means that the neutron has a moment that's pointing in this direction before and after the scattering event, the neutron moment will be pointing in exactly the opposite direction. Um, and so this is uh, illustrated on the right hand side. So if we send up one of these, send the neutron in with this green arrow, um, then uh, if the neutron uh, direction is, is not flipped, then uh, the green arrow will be pointing in the same direction coming out. And if it is flipped, then it, instead it will have turned into this blue arrow pointing down. Um, so so uh, if we have our neutron polarization in this particular direction, then all of the magnetization will induce this spin flip scattering. Um, and in that case, uh, basically, um, uh, spin flip scattering is uh, in general caused only by the magnetic contribution to the scattering. So if I am measuring this particular peak, if I were to send in a polarized beam and I measured the polarization before and afterwards, I would be able to get rid of the nuclear contribution. I would be able to isolate rather the magnetic contribution alone um, instead of having to look at it on top of the large nuclear contribution. So this is an alternate way to get essentially the same information. And sometimes it's helpful to do that by using something like an external field. And sometimes it's helpful to do that using polarization analysis. <clears throat> the downside of using polarization analysis is that um, the ways that you polarize the neutrons almost all, well, they all involve throwing away at least 50% of your neutrons. Um, uh, and if you're, <laughs> this can be a very heavy cost to pay in certain experiments. So one has to decide whether the, uh, which is more important, the precision in the measurement or the intensity. Uh, right, so. This is the most common type of way of using uh, the polarization of the neutrons because it allows you to rapidly detect what is magnetic and what is not magnetic. However, you can do other things. So if the neutron polarization is parallel to a magnetic con contribution, this is what's shown by this green arrow, this dot dashed green arrow here, uh, then uh, the, the, the magnetic, the, there will be scattering by the, by the magnetic contribution, but it will not give you spin flip scattering, it will give you non spin flip scattering. So. If you already know that your scattering is magnetic and only magnetic, then you can place your neutron polarization in this direction and you'll be able to, to work out what contribution the magnetization has in this direction and in this direction. So basically if we, uh, so we can, we can uh, try to get this type of information um, there are some costs associated in terms of loss of neutrons. So there are several different experimental profiles that are commonly um, that are commonly used. Uh, 
You can polarize before the sample. So that means that uh, if this is the sample, you set the polarization here, and then you just measure um, at the other side what happens. You measure the intensity that you observe if you send in the neutrons with the spin up, the green arrow here, and then you measure them with the spins pointing in the opposite direction. And this gives you something that's called the flipping ratio. Um, and, uh, and you can use that to extract some information. Um, you get more complete information by polarizing both before the sample and as in this cartoon after the sample. Um, and then uh, you basically get four different types of measurement that you can make. You get um, uh, non-spin flip. So you get the upspin going to an upspin and you get the upspin going to a downspin, a downspin going to an up and a downspin going to a down. Um, again, you lose some more of your neutrons in, in taking these, these additional polarization um, analysis steps. Uh, but then you can uh, be a lot more precise about what's actually happening with your magnetization. And uh, if you really want to, you can also change the direction of this uh, neutron spin. So this is pointing upwards, but we could put it in either of the two orthogonal directions. And then for each of those orthogonal, di each of those three orthogonal directions, we would be able to measure four different, make four different measurements. So if, uh, if we really need to, we can make 12 different uh, sets of measurements to really pin down what's happening with the magnetization. Um, okay, so, uh, and I should say that within the, Within the literature and the larger magnetic sands community, uh, there is quite some uh, debate about the best ways to proceed with particular measurements. So in some cases, applying a really large magnetic field to force your magnetization to point in one direction, uh, that is a perfectly, uh, perfectly good way to, do, to, to, to avoid having to use any of this polarization. But sometimes what one finds if one does the polarization is that the field is not large enough to always saturate the material. So it can be material dependent and you don't necessarily know that until you've done the experiment. So this is a kind of active area of, uh, of research at the moment, figuring out the best experimental protocols to be sure of what you are seeing in a given experiment. Right. Um, and so in the, uh, okay, right. I'll just take a quick pause there and ask if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask at this point. Okay, right. So now um, we've gone through, uh, so we've gone through, uh, how the uh, neutrons interact with magnetic uh, with uh, the magnetic field distribution that is set up inside a sample, um, and so and the different ways in which we can probe that, and the different types of information that we can get out from the scattering experiment. So the next question is, what can we actually study um, with small angle neutron scattering if we are looking at magnetic materials? So there are two main categories of uh, things that are looked at for magnetic materials. And they break down into um, diffraction at small angles. So this is just, uh, let's say, standard diffraction. It's just that the spacings, the periodicities are very large. And so the scattering angles are very small. Um, so uh, this allows us to look at long length scale periodic structures. And the most famous examples of these are things like skirmions um, and also vortex lattices in superconductors. Uh, this obviously can also be done uh, for non-magnetic uh, non um, examples as well, and there are, there are plenty of those. And in some cases, there are <clears throat> very long length scale magnetic structures that also, that also appear within the, uh, within the diffraction range of uh, sands. And uh, then we have what we might call the, the true small angle scattering, the diffuse small angle neutron scattering, um, which is... Uh, in the non-magnetic uh, context is what you've been learning about over the last uh, day and a half. Um, and so I've already shown you this picture. And this uh, lower picture is a, an example that actually combines contributions of both of these terms. So this is looking at the ion, this is a picture of, um, a picture of the detector, a uh, view from uh, a self-assembled iron oxide nanoparticles. So we can see that we have, uh, we have some um, preferential order. We can see some uh, 
we can see some uh, cylindrically symmetric contribution here in the middle, and then we can see that there is also uh, some sort of uh, periodicity um, giving rise to these uh, to these spots here, and presumably also to these higher order spots here. So these are the main two things that are studied. Um, And so we also have to think about what is going to influence uh, our observed uh, magnetic small angle scattering. So here concentrating on the diffuse components. So everything that you've already heard about still applies. So we could think about particle shape. We could think about packing of particles. We could think about polydispersity. We could think about interparticle interactions. Um, and uh, I've written this as particle shape here, but obviously we could have a matrix that has some uh, precipitates inside it, for example, and we can still use this type of model to describe the behavior. So everything you've already learned applies, but then we have some additional things that we have to consider. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a list of the main contributions. So we have uh, magnetic anisotropy, we have domain walls, demagnetization factors, dead layers, and uh, magnetic interparticle interactions. And I'll say a few words um, about each of these. So if we are looking at uh, a magnetic material, so uh, most uh, magnetic materials, they are, uh, they're not the same in all directions. Um, uh, and there are strong links between the uh, crystal structure and the observed magnetization. So this is just taking an example of the three uh, three ferromagnetic elemental metals, iron, nickel, and cobalt. Um, so iron and nickel both have cubic structures, slightly different cubic structures. And if you look at the magnetization applied, uh, uh, um, when you apply the field, sorry, I seem to have chopped off the axes here, the, the, the applied magnetic field on the x-axis. And if it's applied along a particular crystal, uh, a, a particular high symmetry crystal direction, then you get different uh, responses. Um, so uh, we can see that if you apply the field along the 100 to iron, um, then you get this higher magnetization value and it kicks in earlier. And if you go to the uh, 110 or the, along the 111 direction, then you get uh, slightly different responses and it takes a higher field to force all of the moments to lie parallel to that field, which is what reaching this saturation value implies. So what we say is that the iron um, has its easy axis along the 100 directions. And there are three 100 directions. So um, uh, cubic iron has three, uh, has three easy axes. If we look at nickel, um, then it's cubic, uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's um, uh, body-centered cubic. Um, then uh, we basically see something similar, except that we have the uh, uh, easy axis along the 111 type direction, of which there are four. And if we go to cobalt, cobalt is actually a hexagonal material. Um, and uh, in that case, we can see a strong difference between if we have the magnetic field applied along the C axis, so perpendicular to the hexagonal planes, as opposed to in the hexagonal plane. So we can identify that we will get a different magnetic response along different directions. OK, so uh, what that means is that if we are then looking at, say, um, a cobalt system, if we imagine that we have a whole set of cobalt nanoparticles, for example, or something like that, um, then, uh, then in addition to any shape anisotropy that we have in the particles, there will also be um, a magnetic anisotropy that we have to average over if we want to figure out what the overall magnetization, if we want to extract information on the magnetization from our small angle neutron scattering data. So that, uh, so that we, have to, we have to know this information about the anisotropy and also be able to incorporate that into our simulation of the small angle neutron scattering data. So it's uh, an additional complication. And um, this is one of the things where one can often use um, an applied external field to help with this by effectively trying to ensure that everything is uh, oriented in, a, in, the same, in the same direction. Because what will happen if the is sometimes if um, particles are able to move, if they can rotate. So for example, the obvious example would be if they're in solution, but this can actually also happen um, when you have uh, 
particles embedded in a matrix, the particles may rotate to, um, to minimize the overall energy with respect to the field. And in that case, you can, uh, that can be helpful in that then you know you're only, uh, you know which direction, um, which uh, you, it's easier to take care of the anisotropy in those cases. So that's something one has to consider. Okay, uh, I then move on to domain walls. So in a magnetic material, the magnet will usually minimize its energy by forming domains. So what that means is that uh, rather than have a single domain, it's usually energetically favorable to have multiple domains, um, and then you're reducing the overall stray fields. So you can kind of see that in this cartoon with these arrows showing, these are thin arrows showing the stray fields. Um, so uh, there is a lot of interesting physics in that if you make the material small enough, you reach a point where the energy cost of forming the domain wall is too large. And those types of particles are called super paramagnetic particles. Um, and uh, there's quite a lot of interesting experiments on those. But uh, most of the time, you'll get the formation of domains. Um, and uh, the, uh, the energy associated with these domain walls is uh, based on the anisotropy that we just talked about but also the, uh, the strength of the exchange interaction that is what determines what the magnetic structure is in the material. So we have the formation of these domain walls and bluntly these domains are these domain walls, they are defects. So just like all other defects, they are something that we are very likely to see in a, a small angle neutron scattering experiment. Um, so uh, if the defects, if the domain walls uh, are all aligned in a particular direction that will obviously give us some sort of additional um, additional periodic information or <coughs> orientational information. Um, but uh, in most materials, we may assume that uh, there's a lot more randomization going on. So when we have a magnetic material, one of the ways in which it's most often characterized is with a hysteresis loop, which is shown here. So that we increase them as we increase the magnetic field, uh, from a case where we assume everything is aligned all together and then we end up with the total magnetization dropping going through zero and then reaching saturation on the other side and this can be modeled in terms of uh, a domain picture so that when you're in the uh, saturation case um, or there are no domain walls you've got rid of them all and everything is pointing in the in the same direction and then as you um, move around the hysteresis loop, you get the uh, formation of domain wall, you get the formation of domains that eventually leads to the flipping so that when I get to this particular point, the arrow points in the other way. And if you have a material that's been sitting outside of a magnetic field for a long time, you will end up with the formation of domains through, um, through thermal effects typically. And you can uh, destroy those that way you can alter those domains by applying the magnetic field for the first time, which is what, what this uh, this line here represents and we can see this is basically an artistic representation of what might be happening in a particular set of domains and so we have all of these defects or domain walls and so we can uh, we may get scattering off the domain walls we also may have some characteristic domain size so this is just like our particle uh, if we we can think of these domains as particles where the difference between the particles is the direction of the moment. And then you can use all of the things that you've been learning about to characterize that behavior. Um, so, so far that's this color picture of the way to think about magnetization. All I'm saying is that this has a different magnetic, this has a different scattering length density to this portion purely because of the direction of the moment. Um, and uh, so this is something that we should be able to, should be able to look at However, things get a bit more complicated when we actually think about what's happening inside the domain walls. Um, so there are typically two types of domain wall that we can consider. These are called the nail wall and the block wall. And uh, hopefully uh, you can get an idea of what the difference is by, uh, from, the, from these pictures. So here we have a rotation in the plane of the wall and here the rotation is out of the plane of the spins. Um, so you can perhaps see that from these side views of, uh, of what's happening. And uh, the important point here is, first of all, that we have changes in the magnetization that we will be able to pick up in our scattering, because uh, as you can see, if we've aligned all the moments in this direction, we have uh, some transverse component here. And we will normally be very sensitive to these transverse components because of the way uh, 
because of this uh, only picking up the magnetization perpendicular to the scattering ve vector. So for example, if our scattering vector is set up so that it's uh, parallel to this, then we will be very sensitive to what's happening here. Um, from the point of view of what you've been learning about looking at small angle scattering from particles, unfortunately, domain walls are not sharp interfaces. They typically have a, they have, can have variable length, but it's never one single or going from one atom to the next that you have the, the, the shift, or that's very rare. Um, and so the magnetization changes over a relatively long distance. And what this means is that the um, assumptions that are built into, for example, Porod's law regarding sharp interfaces, they're not always appropriate. And so that means that one has to um, <coughs> modify those descriptions and um, to be able to take, take into account the actual nature of the interfaces that um, you are looking at. And so there are a variety of ways um, in which this can be done, um, uh, but they obviously all add some additional complication into the process. And so that means if you're looking at a magnetic material, uh, you will not expect to get a, you would not normally expect to get a Q to the minus four dependence if you're, if you're extracting the intensity as a function of Q. Okay, um, right, so that was domain walls. If I now move on to the demagnetization factor. So if I have any sample that is uniformly magnetized, and it, has a, it will have a particular shape. And there will be an associated demagnetization field with that particular shape. Um, and this is just, a, this is just a, a natural consequence of uh, thinking about what happens electromagnetically if we have a particle in a magnetic field that has a magnetization induced by that field. Um, and uh, if we have a thin film, this is kind of our optimal case, then we would have no demagnetization factor. Basically, if you think about the directions of the magnetic field lines, they just go straight through the thin film. If we have a sphere, a perfect sphere, then we can calculate this demagnetization factor and it is one third. If we have a, uh, an ellipse, uh, sorry, an ellipsoid, um, <clears throat> then uh, we can extract a formula for this uh, for this demagnetization factor if we know enough about the properties of the ellipse of the ellipsoid, and if we have an irreg irregular shape, uh, then this is very very difficult to calculate. Um, and in fact, you would normally have to you have to do this you'd have to calculate it numerically. Um, and the reason that this is important is that if you if the information you want to get out is related to the magnetization, then you need to be able to figure out what the effective field is for those particular particles. So this is something that one has to think about. Okay, um, so I've gone through the first uh, three examples here. Um, and then uh, uh, there are a couple of other factors here at the end. So magnetic dead layers, it's quite common that if I have a magnetic material um, at the surface or at some interface with another layer, there will be a small region where um, I will not get the magnetization I might expect. So I might have a cobalt atom, but because it's uh, only interacting with a small number of other cobalt atoms and then something else on the uh, other side of the interface or surface, that I will not get magnetization on that cobalt. So that's known as a dead layer. Um, and this is uh, this basically just means that you have to add in some additional information about uh, the scattering length density. So it means if you're looking at a particle, a magnetic nanoparticle, you may find one particular um, particle size uh, from your structural uh, structural small angle neutron scattering. But then if you were to look just at the magnetic contribution, you would find that the particle size was slightly smaller. And that difference would be this dead layer around the outside. And then finally, magnetic interparticle interactions. So these definitely take place over long ranges because uh, the magnetic field is a long range force. Um, and uh, they, can be, they can be quite complicated. Um, so this is, uh, so we know that these happen. Dealing with these at, at the moment is very much on a case by case basis. Um, and uh, the, this is the figuring out how to deal with this in a much more systematic way as, a, as an active area of research at the moment. Okay, so um, uh, to summarize, um, we've looked at the difference between nuclear and magnetic scattering of neutrons. I've tried to show what that means for our experiments. 
and how we can optimize our experiments to take advantage of this and what we need to do to account for when we're measuring uh, magnetic materials. Okay, so I mentioned that there will be some uh, references at the end. Um, so uh, these are three uh, good textbooks that go through the details. Um, so this first one talks quite a lot about magnetization and particularly uh, polar considering the effects of polarization. This book here goes through that in a lot more detail. Um, if you're not already aware, this uh, if you go to this particular website, you can get a copy of this, which has a lot of practical information that's very helpful. Um, and there's a, an excellent review from 2019 uh, that runs through magnetic small angle neutron scattering, um, and it runs through um, uh, it runs through a lot of uh, basically some of the examples that I've talked about here um, and. Uh, a little bit more about some of the experimental details that one has to go through. And uh, I will be giving uh, a talk tomorrow on um, applications of some of these aspects. So we'll be looking in uh, a bit more detail at some examples of what you can extract from the small angle diffraction case, and also uh, some examples um, use looking at uh, looking at nanoparticles using a field um, to determine the uh, to um, determine the direction and then extracting information from that. Um, and also uh, using polarization analysis to extract information. But at that point, I'll um, stop. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Uh. Hi, Professor Blackburn. Uh, I wrote a question in the chat, but... Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see it. Ah, no worries. No worries. Uh, would, you, would you like me to read it? Uh, no, or, I can uh, see it now. I can see uh, it. <laughs> Looking at uh, magnetic layers of amorphous iron, is it possible to use magnetic sounds with an external magnetic field to see the response of the magnetization direction and also find it? So um, in this case, it would be best to, in the laboratory, first of all, figure out what field you need, so in a squid or a magnetometer of some description, yes. to try to figure out what the magnetic saturation is there. Um, okay. And then uh, you would be able to do an experiment to look at the uh, behavior with respect to the, the film, the, the plane of the film and out of the plane, and possibly other directions. There would be a potential. Uh, so. To be honest, if the thin films like this, then grazing incidence, small angle neutron scattering, which I think you'll hear about a bit in the next talk this afternoon, will be the best tool to do that. And you can certainly do that using this. Uh, I mean, you can do magnetic grazing incidence, small angle neutron scattering, following the principles that I've outla outlined here. Because to look at the thin film uh, kind of appropriately, a, a reflection type geometry is most efficient. OK. OK. Um, and the other thing I would just add there is that, as I said, you want to get some idea of what the saturation is before you come to the neutron facility. Um, but uh, what, what one often finds is that the neutron scattering can pick up, uh, can pick up uh, traces of, uh, traces of, def of, uh, spins that have not yet saturated well beyond where the magnetometer indicates everything is saturated. Um, so I didn't include a reference to that here, but I think in the Review of Modern Physics article, there is there are some references to the literature on that, or I can send you some information if you're interested. I have a, there's a nice paper that discusses it. That would be great. Uh, so if I understood it correctly, uh, I first tried with uh, squid or BSM or some other magnet magnetometer, and then uh, then do a, a magnetic phase sensor. Yeah, so that yes, um, that that would be that would be one way to look at it. Um, I guess that you could also get some information from reflectometry, from polarized neutron reflectometry. Um, so they give uh, so the reflectometry, polarized neutron reflectometry, tells you about what is happening in the direction, uh, the normal to the plane. And the okay. grazing incidence, small angle neutron scattering can tell you also about what's happening um, away from uh, uh, well, in the plane a little bit. Okay, uh, actually, uh, samples has been sent for uh, PNR measurements okay. to Super Island. Right. Uh, I was just trying to incorporate something. Yeah. 
in some way. <laughs> but uh, okay, great. Uh, then I know. Uh, thank you so much. No problem. Okay, and then uh, Surrender has a question. If we have core shell nanoparticles and you get from the XMCD that the gold is magnetic, can we get some more information on the magnetic moment of the gold? Okay, so, um, so with the neutron scattering, um, you get the interaction with the magnetic field as a whole. Um, and so if so it can be difficult to identify specifically that your contribution is coming from the gold unless uh, unless the, the um, I'm just going to show this other slide that I have with them some thing. So if the if the size of the shell if the shell is very thin this would basically be impossible because the probably the errors would be larger than the thickness larger than the thickness of the shell. Um, but if uh, if one is able to get enough resolution, uh, then one would be able to say that there was a difference in the magnetic uh, magnetic diameter and in the structural diameter. Then you could argue that the gold is magnetic. Uh, that you could argue that you could get some information on that. Um, I do think though that probably I would have thought that resonant X-ray techniques would be a better way to explore this than. To, to kind of confirm that you've definitely got the signal on the gold rather than the neutron scattering technique in this case, because um, I'm assuming that that the that the that the thicknesses are small, but maybe you have some more information on that. Okay. So in in principle, with X-rays, obviously you can do small angle X-ray scattering, which is not uh, sensitive to the magnetization. In principle, one could do resonant small angle X-ray scattering, um, and then you would be able to get to, to look directly at the gold contribution or the iron contribution. Um, you can't then get absolute numbers out, but it can still be helpful for confirming that you're seeing something. <laughs> 